Hi, my name is Sue Mallett. Welcome to this short course on designing diagnostic test accuracy studies, the absolute essentials you need to know. I work at the Centre for Medical Imaging at UCL in London in the UK, and I'm going to share with you important tips I've learned in designing these studies over the last 20 years. The introduction to diagnostic accuracy studies is a series of short videos, each highlighting a key learning point. In each video, there are short activities where I encourage you to pause the video and think. If you're watching with colleagues, this is a great opportunity to discuss together. I'll sh after each activity side, I'll share with you my thought and insights. This is part two, the importance of clinical pathway. In this video, we're going to talk and think about how the diagnostic accuracy of each test depends on when the test is used in a clinical pathway. And this means that a study design needs to evaluate a test for a particular role and a particular position on a patient pathway. Patrick Besite has published this fantastic article with a really helpful diagram here. And this helps us think about what we're aiming to do in our study. So let's look at the existing situation. Here we have a population of patients who have some initial tests, and these, part, these are the inclusion criteria for our study. Here's our diagnostic accuracy study. We're taking an existing test and we're working out who's positive or negative with that test. OK, so let's imagine now what we want to do is look at replacing the existing test with a new test. OK, we'll call this replacement uh, study. So here, all we've done is we've switched the existing test, the blue box, for the orange box. And we've got the new test. And again, the people come in, they have the same initial tests, and then they have the new test instead of the old one. A further way we need to think about designing the study is if we're going to use the test as a triage test for the existing test. And this means that we're going to use a new test in advance of the existing test. And then we're going to actually use the new test to decide who gets the existing test. OK, so here we've got the population of uh, patients. Again, we might have some initial tests that define the inclusion criteria. Then we've got our new test and we're going to decide based on the results of that new test who gets the existing tests. So in this uh, situation, we've got everyone who's positive with the new test gets the existing test. We could have had a design for a different test and a different disease where everyone who's negative with the new test gets the existing test. OK. Another design is where we want to use the new test as an add on to the existing test. So we've got our population of patients. We've got our initial tests that form the inclusion criteria. People have the existing test and then based on their results of the existing test, we decide who has the new test. OK, and in this diagram, we've shown everyone who's negative with the existing test has a new test. So here we're hoping to get new people with a disease that were missed by the existing test. We could also um, add the new test onto the um, people who get a positive result for existing test. If the existing test is over calling people and there are lots of false positives, we might want the new test to actually sort out who are the true positives and who are the false positives. So this is a really helpful diagram to help us think about the importance of clinical pathway. And what we will find as we do studies in these different ways is that the performance of the new test is completely different in terms of things like sensitivity and specificity when you have it as a replacement, when you have it as a triage and when you have it as an add on. And I think from this diagram, it's really clear that actually that's mainly because they're completely different people who are in the study. If you look at the replacement test, you've got exactly the same people who were in the, having the new test as they were having the existing test. OK, whereas here in the triage study, you've got a, a different set of people having the new test and the existing test. OK. And um, so some of the people do not go on to get that existing test. And here, again, you can see that the people who get the new test are only a subset of the people who have the existing test. And that's based on what their results were from the existing test. OK, so what we can see is that when we are thinking of these different study designs, what we're thinking is actually of using the test on different populations of people. OK, so here's one of our pause and think exercises. 
So here's the question we try and answer. What happens to a test accuracy at different time points in a clinical pathway? Is a test equally useful at different time points? OK, we're going to start with our objective we used in, in um, the first video, where we've got a diagnostic test, uh, where we're looking at a diag diagnostic test accuracy of persistent cough for diagnosis of lung cancer. OK, and here's, here again is our little flow chart. Patients come in, they're going off to their primary care doctor or their GP, um, and their GP might decide that they need their cough needs referral, or it might decide that the, their cough means they've got another diagnosis or there's insufficient suspicion it could be cancer. And so they're um, asked to come back in, maybe in a few weeks' time or something. Uh, when they're attending... Um, so if the primary care doctor thinks that actually their cough could be persistent cancer, they will probably send them off to the hospital for a CT or a chest X-ray. OK, and some of those people are find something on that CT or chest X-ray that is suspicious of cancer. In other cases, they'll find there's nothing there for suspicion of cancer. Or they might find there's something there that indicates another disease entirely. OK, and after that, those who have the chest X-ray that has something on there that's suspicious of cancer, they will go on for further imaging. So they'll probably go on for another CT to look at that in more detail and really to stage and think about whether that really is a cancer. Um, and then, again, if the imaging is turning up positive, then they'll go on to have probably a biopsy or histology um, to actually work out whether it is cancer or not and confirm it. And that's the reference standard for um, lung cancer for everyone who's um, got lesions and imaging that's suspicious of cancer. OK, so... Right. What? OK, so for this pause and think exercises, we, what we're going to do is think about what happens to the test accuracy if we use this persistent cough at different time points in the clinical pathway. So here's time point one where we've got the um, where we're using the persistent cough when someone attends a primary care doctor. Here's time point two where we're using the persistent cough for people when they come to the hospital for that CT or chest X-ray. Time point three is when people come to the hospital and what they're now they've been something's been found that's suspicious on the chest x-ray and they're just about to go into their further imaging so they're having a persistent cough test here and here um, this is for people who they've had the biopsy and histology result back is a persistent cough useful for diagnosis of lung cancer here okay so what i want you to do is pause the video now and think about what happens to the diagnostic accuracy of the persistent cough at these four time points and also think about whether you think that this test is equally useful at all these different time points. Okay so pause the video now and have a think and I will we'll look forward to um, seeing you in the pause and think discussion when you've had a chance to think for yourselves. Okay welcome back to the pause and think discussion. What we're doing is working out whether all these four different time points of using persistent cough potentially as a test during the clinical pathway, whether the accuracy is the same at these different time points and whether the test is equally useful at the different time points. Time point one is when they're at their um, primary care doctor and they might have a persistent cough and the doctor's using that as the, almost the first test to work out whether they've got, whether they're at suspicion of having lung cancer. OK, so at this time, there may be lots of other things that persistent cough could be about. They might have asthma. They might have tree pollen asthma. They might have um, cold weather asthma. They might have whooping cough. They might just have a common cold. They might have flu, all sorts of different things. So the, the, the GP is probably going to uh, look at persistent cough, but they're probably also going to ask other questions as well. But let's imagine they use just persistent cough on its own or persistent cough with clinical history um, and the accuracy, there would be lots of people who would have a cough but who wouldn't actually have lung cancer. So there'd be lots of false positives, wouldn't there? OK, so, but if we look at time point two, which is when someone actually attends the hospital and they're just about to have this CT or chest X-ray, we know that the doctor has already filtered out a whole bunch of people who have persistent cough for other reasons. Um, and 
So the number of false positives is actually reduced because we've got a different set of people we're doing the test on. OK, so um, the, we've probably we've probably got the same sort of sensitivity. Um, that's the same ability to detect people who are positive with um, with a with lung cancer. Although it might be raised a bit because some of the with some of the people wouldn't actually um, wouldn't actually have a cough that is good enough. Well, some people with lung cancer wouldn't have a cough at all um, if they went if they have very mild you know, very, very early stages, they might not have a cough. Um, so we may, we've missed a few people, um, but it's probably a similar number that we've missed at time point one, but we've got many fewer false positives. So the specificity is going to be much higher at this point because the GP has actually uh, removed a lot of people who would have been false positives and they're not sent on to the hospital. Okay, now if we're looking at the people here, now at time point three, what we've got is we've only got the people who had something on the chest X-ray that was suspicious of lung cancer. So again, what we've done is we've reduced down the number of false positives. We may have lost a few um, early cancers as well. Um, but again, we can see mainly it's probably the, the specificity that's um, going up because of the reduction of those false positives. Actually, losing some of those people whose cancer didn't show up on the chest X-ray probably also means that we've got the people who've got um, more advanced cancer. We've probably lost some of those early stage cancers again. And so actually, again, the sensitivity is going to go up. Um, OK. So and then what happens if we use the persistent cough at the same time as we get the biopsy and histology results? Um, well, actually, at this time point, this test is completely irrelevant, isn't it? Because we've got the gold standard test now. Only the people who had a high suspicion of cancer have got through to the biopsy and histology stage. And now we've got the definitive result from, from that histology. So um, persistent cough, whether they're coughing or not, is only a matter of treating their, their symptoms. It's not a matter of diagnosing with lung cancer. And again, actually, if you think about it, by the time you get to... A, um, actually looking at imaging, you're probably no longer interested in cough as a diagnostic test because the cough is actually only telling you about symptoms um, that maybe need treating for the patient's comfort, but it's not telling you about um, whether they've got lung cancer because now you've got imaging so you can actually see much more. OK, and so what you can see is actually as we go through these time points, we get increasing accuracy of the persistent cough as a test, but actually decreasing relevance. And probably it would only be at time point one where it might be useful test. So what I'm hoping you've uh, had a chance to think about with this exercise is that diagnostic test accuracy is highly dependent on when it's used in the clinical pathway. So recapping on what we've learned so far, when you're designing these studies, we've learned so far that the tests, when we're doing a diagnostic test accuracy study, studies need to be conducted in normal clinical practice on patients who would usually get the test, on unselected patients who would usually get the test, and at the same point in the clinical pathway. So did you do well with the activity? Well done. And see you in part three the outcomes used to summarise test accuracy studies.